Today we are reading from the first book in the Old Testament, Genesis. We've been there a couple of Sundays. We are reading from chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he married. Rebekah, daughter of Bethel the Armenian of Padanaram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer. And his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. Good morning. Today I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, vision people, vision people. One day at this party I was attending, there was a book of questions. In the book, there were all these questions you never really kind of think about. But suddenly, once you ask the question out loud, your mind starts to thinking. These kind of questions are good for generating conversation. Real easy for folks to fall in either camp A or camp B as they began to defend why they chose their answer. And so it was at this particular party, the question came out, if you could have $100 now or wait two months and get $200, which would you choose? Well, before I could even answer, someone spoke up and said, I would take the $100. 
Well, I knew immediately that that person was in Camp A and I was in Camp B. I was absolutely intrigued. It made all the sense in the world to wait eight weeks and get double the money. There was just no two ways of looking at this. It was clear to me that one should wait. And so it made it harder for me to understand all the people who were in Camp A and who decided that if the 100 was available, they would take it right then and there. And the person that spoke up first, her response was, I don't want to wait. Give me what I got coming to me now. I want my $100 right now. In the biblical text today is the story of two brothers. Esau, the older brother, is starving. He's been working all day and he's managed to work up an appetite and he comes in and his brother is cooking some delicious food and he's hungry. And so he says to his brother, can you give me some of that that you're cooking? And the brother makes an offer to him. Sure, I can give you plenty of this. Sell your birthright and I will give you this food. It's more like take your hundred dollars today instead of waiting for 200 tomorrow. His brother sees that Esau is vulnerable and says, if I have to feed you, are you willing to sell your birthright? We, the reader, can already see that's a dumb idea because we are sitting far enough away to see that it's not a good idea to sell your birthright. We, the reader, do not feel the weight of the moment. But here is Esau starving, feeling the immediacy of the moment of feeling famished. So Esau says, why wouldn't I sell my birthright? I could die right now. I'm starving. I'm hungry. And so he satisfies the need that is right in front of him, his hunger not realizing that the meal being offered to him is only a temporary solution to a larger problem. From the womb, these two brothers had been at odds. Coming out of the womb, they jockeyed for first, Jacob holding on to the heel of Esau. Esau was first, and in the biblical times, the firstborn was the heir of all of dad's possessions. As the brothers grow together, their differences become more and more evident, more and more pronounced. They are twins who are completely unalike. Their personalities are not the same. They choose different occupations. And to exacerbate the situation, their parents each favor one child over the other. Rebecca loving Jacob and Isaac favoring Esau. These two brothers didn't get along. More and more in our country, these United States of America is starting to feel like two nations, Jacob and Esau. On my recent visit to Virginia, which is a little further south and a little further east than the Midwest Chicago, I could feel this division like a tear that is growing larger and larger, almost feeling like this tear, this division is beyond repair. I saw hundreds and hundreds of folks gathered while city workers took down Stonewall Jackson statue, a monument that had been there since the Civil War in Richmond, Virginia. One lone man with his flag jumps into the action trying to stop this piece of history from happening. The crowd nicely removes him, takes his flag, and burns it up. And yet just a couple of days later, closer to where my mom lives, on the 4th of July, I see this man with a big white truck, you know, the big wheels, with a big pole, and a flag, a Confederate flag on the end of it, driving while the wind is whipping the flag back and forth, proud of his Confederate flag. Folks 
are ending relationships and cutting ties with people who do not believe as they do. Just this past weekend, I was reading about how schools are struggling all over the country about whether to open or whether to stay closed, and we are divided again. You can almost guess in certain states, people feel like the school should open, and in other states, people feel like the school should stay closed. This division, this tear, two nations, over a hundred years ago, Abraham Lincoln, even before he was the president of the United States, spoke to the Senate that this two nations cannot exist. It cannot be that we have in the South slaves and in the North we have free color. And while the House was divided, later we would experience the Civil War. But in that moment, Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself will fall. Maybe our country has been two nations for longer than we realize. Maybe the tear was happening decades and centuries ago. We live in a country where one have recently celebrated July 4th and one celebrates Juneteenth where Frederick Douglass questioned what is July 4th to the slave still carries meaning for brown colored skinned people. Many of his comrades thought Abraham Lincoln was foolish for the speech he made, but he was courageous, they also admitted, because he had a vision of something that had yet to happen. He had a vision of emancipation. With social distancing, we have been meeting friends in the park. Before we go to the park, I pack up stuff to carry to the park. And I always ask my son, do you want to pack a bottle of water? And every time I ask him that, he's like, no, I'm not thirsty. At which point, I try to remind him, you might not be thirsty now, but you might get thirsty later. And feeling frustrated with me, he's like, no, mom, I don't need a bottle of water. He insists in that moment that he does not need water. So what do I do? I pack a bottle of water for me and him, and I get a lot of ice, and I put it in the bag. And then when we get to the park to do social distancing and meet with our friends and after kids have been running around for a while, what do you think happens to this kid that insisted he didn't need a bottle of water? Well, I'll tell you what happened on this past week. He walks up to me and he grabs his water bottle. And after he's cleaned his water bottle, he begins to try to take my water bottle. See, I believe he has what many of us have in America, a lack of vision. You see, in the moment, he thinks he's not thirsty, but he has no vision for the future. We can often only see what is right in front of us. But vision people don't just recognize they're not thirsty right here. They have a vision for the future. Jacob knew that Esau's birthright was everything. Esau could only see right in front of him. He said, what good is my birthright when I'm starving and I'm going to die? A little bit of melodrama going on, if I do say so myself. But Jacob has a vision, and when the opportunity presents him, he takes it. He understands no matter how manipulative he is, and I know there's a whole lot of family dysfunction going on here, but he understands the importance of the birthright, and he understands the vision for a future. You see, Esau wants food to fill this immediate need, while Jacob is more interested in having what his brother has and places very little value on it his birthright. 
Esau took for granted what was already his. No, no, I'm not thirsty right now. As the younger brother Jacob understood what his brother had and how important it was to the future. Michelle Payne was the 10th child of her parents' union. At six months old, her mother died in a car crash, leaving her father to raise all 10 kids. He trained all of his kids how to race horses. At the age of seven, Michelle had a vision that she would one day win the Melbourne Cup. Horse racing is one of the most dangerous sports one can participate in. And Michelle would fall many times, one time fracturing her skull and bruising her brain. The doctors would tell her not to compete. But Michelle had a vision. At 15, with this vision in her head, she leaves school to train full time. She says anything is possible if you persist and you're willing to do the hard work. Her dad teaches her that winning is not about the fastest. It's not about the con artist, but it's waiting for the gap to open because when that gap opens, that's God talking. And her dad says, you better move, Kit. In November 2015, Michelle Payne would be the first woman to win first place in the fifth to compete in the Melbourne race. She won this cup at 30 years old. For 23 years, she had a vision, and that vision did not materialize for 23 years. Others gave up on her. She was considered the last place in this race. But Michelle Payne had a vision, and for that moment when God opened up a way, she took it. United, I'm calling us to be vision people because it's easy to think you're not thirsty. It's easy to think I need to eat today. It's easy to see what's right in front of our face. But vision people wait. Vision people are not desperate and they're not despondent and they don't take the first offer that comes the way of our church. Vision people are focused and can see the bigger picture. Vision people understand the importance of our birthright. Vision people understand there will be falls and bumps and setbacks, but we get up. Vision people understand that there might be red lights, there might be yellow lights, there might be a lot of pausing, there might be 23 years, but when it's green, go. And when God opens a door, you run. Vision people have vision. I invite you as we go into a church meeting tomorrow night and as we look at the future of our church to not become in despair or despondent, even as it relates to your life. Sometimes it's so easy to look at the bills and allow ourselves to fall into a space. But I invite you on this day to have vision, to have a vision for yourself, to have a vision for your community and to have vision for our church. Vision people have vision. Amen.